So, Tristan, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you for the uh, introduction, Brigitte. So the title of my talk is What's in a Poem? Assessing the Relationship Between Phonological and Semantic Distance and the Perceived Funniness of Punning Jokes. And what I'm about to present uh, is actually joint work with uh, former master's student of mine, Anna Palman, who did a lot of the work uh, that uh, you'll see presented in this talk. So before I begin, just a brief outline of how the talk is going to proceed. So I'll talk a bit about the theater, theoretical background uh, of uh, uh, linguistic analyses of puns, uh, then get on to our, uh, the research questions uh, that we addressed in this study. I'll talk about the methods that we used, and then I'll present and analyze the results and uh, end with some uh, concluding words. And then I believe we'll probably have some time to take questions. So let's start with the uh, theoretical background. So punning, as you probably know, is a form of humorous language play in which a word or a phrase uh, is used to evoke the meaning of another word or phrase with a similar or identical pronunciation. So in the punning joke, we refer, we refer to the more obvious surface form as the pun and the similar sounding word that, we, that it evokes as the target. So on this uh, slide are some examples of punning jokes in German and English. Um, so I'll just uh, go over the English one. So we have a picture here of Ben Stiller and with the caption, no matter how still you are, Ben is stiller. So in this punning joke, the pun uh, is the word uh, stiller. Uh, and uh, there is the identical sounding word. Uh, stiller is also the target, but of course they have different meanings. So the surface meaning, uh, Stiller might be uh, the, the, the surname of, of the actor Ben Stiller, and uh, the other meaning of Stiller is more still. So punning is actually one of the uh, most studied phenomena uh, in the linguistics of humor. And most linguistic analyses of puns to date have been taxonomic or phonological. These studies describe the permissible and preferential um, sound transformations between the pun and its target, uh, in terms of things like uh, the types of articulatory features or the number of segments that are affected or their positions in the lexical or syllabic structure, that sort of thing. And uh, even though native speakers have implicit knowledge of these transformational rules, otherwise we wouldn't get punny humor, uh, they must be learned or explicitly modeled in computational applications, at least if they want to be able to process puns. There's been some other work on the uh, semantics of puns. So Pierre Guihot, for example, uh, discusses loss of meaning as a feature of humor and observes what he calls the defunctionalization of language in puns. And uh, using the generalized theory of verbal humor as a framework, uh, more recent studies have identified the logical mechanism of puns as something called cradalistic syllogism. And uh, this fancy sounding term basically just means that if meaning motivates sound, then the meaning of similar sounding words must also be similar. Now, this line of reasoning is an example of the faulty logic underpinning much humor. Uh, and that's because cradalism is completely at odds with the canonical assumption of conventional linguistics that the relationship between words and their meanings is arbitrary and specific to a particular language. Now, it's important to note that while cradalism and the GTVH can tell us why punning jokes are funny in the general sense, they don't give us any explanation as to why some punning jokes are considered to be funnier than others. And this is one of the things that we'll be looking at in this talk. Also, whether and how phonological features contribute to the humorousness of a pun has long been an open question. Some studies have posited a, a correlation between, on the one hand, the degree of phonetic similarity between the pun and the target, and on the other hand, the successfulness or the funniness or the humorousness of the pun. Uh, others, however, reject this hypothesis, uh, basing their arguments on uh, back towards the semantic uh, end of things, semantic theories of humor, and also on informal evidence from non-humorous uh, wordplay. Uh, more recent empirical evidence from certain forms of humorous but non-punning wordplay does establish that perceived humor 
uh, can be a quantifiable function of entropy distance to the source word. So in this talk, I'm gonna present the results of a further empirical study, uh, one of whose aims was to determine whether this finding also applies to real puns. But first, let me give you just a little bit more theoretical background. Uh, so this slide here gives an overview of the possible relations between the surface form of a pun and the latent target. So in terms of pronunciation, uh, we can make a distinction between homophony and heterophony. Uh, either the two forms, pun and target, are pronounced uh, exactly the same, or they're pronounced differently. And as for the uh, written forms, if you write down a pun or you encounter it in written form, uh, we can make a similar distinction between homography and heterography. Um, and so as the examples here demonstrate, puns can be homographic, homophonic, both or neither. Uh, so we'll just work through the examples briefly here. So here's a pun, a political prisoner, is one who stands behind her convictions. So here we have convictions being used in two senses, uh, either a criminal conviction or a firmly held belief. And the two words here are spelled and pronounced exactly the same. On the other hand, we might have a pun which is homophonic, but heterographic. So she fell through the window, but felt no pain. So the, the pun here is P-A-N-E, referring to the glass of a window. Uh, but the latent target uh, pain, that is when something hurts, is spelled P-A-I-N. Pronounced the same, but spelled differently. So we can have uh, a homographic but heterophonic pun. So a lumberjack's world revolves on its axes. So here, uh, axes uh, mean the plural of axis uh, about which something revolves. Um, and uh, axis, the plural of the word ax, a tool used by lumberjacks. So again, different meanings. Uh, different uh, pronunciations, uh, but we have the same spellings. And finally, we can have a, a pun which is both heterographic and heterophonic. So the sign of the nudist camp read clothed until April. So the pun here is clothed, meaning wearing clothes, and the target is closed, uh, meaning shut. So again, both the pronunciation and the spelling here are different. Um, and one more piece of terminology is when we talk about an imperfect pun. The term imperfect means one which is, uh, which is either heterographic or heterophonic or both. Now, it's known that any given pair of words can be characterized by their similarity or their perceived similarity in terms of sound or pronunciation. Uh, studying word pairs that are known to be related by some phonologically constrained process, such as punning or rhyming or erroneous production, or morphological derivation or etymological derivation, uh, these can all help us model the phonological rules at play in these processes or in language generally. And conversely, a model that quantifies perceived sound differences between words can help us judge the likelihood or acceptability of a given relationship between them. In particular, a model of sound similarity, which is tuned to puns, could be used to help detect or generate them computationally. Now, one of the earliest and most influential studies of the, on the sound similarity of words, uh, in general, that is, is that of uh, Vincent Winkler. And they start by producing an optimal alignment of phonemes between the two words, such that each phoneme is paired with either a single phoneme in the corresponding word or else with a null segment. They then compute the proportion of non-matching phoneme positions. And they call this the predicted phonetic distance or PPD. So for example, if we want to compute the distance between the word relation and the word underwritten, uh, what we would do is we would write out the phonetic transcriptions as we've shown here using the uh, international phonetic alphabet, and we would align them on a grid here. And then we would observe that if we just count these, that nine of these 11 positions uh, don't match. And so our PPD would be nine divided by 11 uh, is approximately 0.8. Now, while this method actually correlates fairly well with human similarity judgments, it was found to work much better if you apply it separately to the syllable onset, the nucleus and the coda, and then take the average. So Witts and uh, Winkler conclude then that perceived similarity owes much more to syllable structure than to raw phonemes. A, a major flaw with this approach, however, is that it glosses over the problem of how to optimally align the phonemes in the first place. Uh, it's a simple matter to write out the uh, phonetic transcription of two words, but then deciding exactly uh, which 
uh, phonemes to pair across words is actually a very hard problem uh, and one to which considerable subsequent research has been devoted. Um, subsequent to Vincent Winkler, a lot of sound similarity models have been developed on the basis of shared articulatory features in the classical uh, Chomsky and feature matrix. Uh, and while these systems are elegant and widely used, uh, in practice, many sounds judged by humans to be substitutable in punning can differ in a very large number of features. So for example, uh, in some feature spaces, the phonemes uh, ya and j would have nine contrasting features, even though the two sounds uh, are actually close enough to be commonly confused by many speakers. As further evidence of this, and to give an example that's actually relevant for our purposes, these two sounds are not uncommonly contrasted in puns, as demonstrated by this example of a pun uh, from yoke to joke. So trying to preserve his savoir pair in a new restaurant, the guest looked down at the eggs the waiter had spilled in his lap and said brightly, well, I guess the yolk's on me. Now, there have been various attempts at mitigating this problem, ranging from the use of multi-valued features and salience coefficients to the use of uh, optimality theory. A few authors have extended this general work on sound similarity by applying it specifically to puns. And this has resulted in a few articles and even a couple of book length studies. So in 1974, Franz Josef Hausmann studied a collection of French puns and observed that the puns and the targets never differed by more than four phonemes. And this led some secret researchers to posit the existence of some upper limit on the tolerable dissimilarity between a pun and its length of target. In a later study by Langerquist agreed uh, that people making puns tend to strive for homophony, even in imperfect puns. And moreover, uh, they found that it is particularly important to preserve the number and stress position of syllables. Uh, Langerquist also observed that when a sound change does occur in punning, it almost always occurs on a stressed syllable. Uh, Twicky and Swicky observed that certain segments do not occur equally often in puns and targets, and they dubbed this phenomenon ousting. So they say that uh, Y ousts X when Y appears as a pun substitute for the latent target X significantly more often than the reverse. And uh, Walter Sapkowiak presented the first book length study on the phonology of puns in 1991. He confirmed many of Rogerquist's findings and also concluded that sound changes to consonants tend to prefer word initial and word final positions. Nonetheless, pun understandability is maximized when the uh, consonantal skeleton is kept largely intact. That is, vowels carry a lower information load and therefore are more freely mutable across the pun and target. Uh, and also briefly, there's a great deal of past work on modeling the semantic similarity of arbitrary pairs of words. And since this work is not specific to puns, I'm not going to go into a lot of the background details here, uh, but I will briefly describe some well-known algorithms later in this talk. Uh, for now, it's sufficient to know that there are two general approaches to quantifying the difference in meaning between only two words. Uh, so the first of these is a, a network-based similarity, where, uh, for example, if we take the lexicon and we uh, write down every word or every sense of a word and put them in a sort of a graph structure like what you see here with connections between the words or the concepts, maybe in a is a relationship or a has a relationship or maybe an arbitrary label, label relationships that you see here, um, then we can compute the, the, the similarity of any, any two uh, words by uh, looking at the, the path between the two, maybe the shortest path between the two uh, in the graph, uh, or, or maybe making it a bit more complicated than that. So those, that's what network graph, uh, sorry, network based um, semantic similarity algorithms do. Uh, the other kind is called information based similarity. And uh, these compute the similarity between words uh, using shared underlying information content between concepts, uh, usually using a very large reference corpus. So uh, very much a statistical approach. Uh, rather than modeling uh, the entire lexicon as a graph and then doing everything symbolically. So uh, wrapping up the, uh, the, the background section, as we've seen here, there's no great shortage of past work on modeling the sound similarity of arbitrary pairs of words or on puns in particular. And by and large, the analyses that have been done on puns tend to agree with one another. 
There's also a great deal of past work on measuring the semantic similarity between words. So the long-term challenge for computational humorists then is to how to consolidate all this research into a single model that can be implemented computationally. And why would we actually want to do this? Uh, well, uh, there are basically upstream and downstream benefits to doing this. Upstream, we can use computational approaches to derive new linguistic insights into the nature of humor and the nature of wordplay. That is, we can use our computational tools uh, to better understand what makes a pun funny, or what are the uh, permissible sound or meaning transformations uh, between a pun and its target. Uh, downstream, we might have applications in natural language processing, for example, data mining in the digital humanities. Uh, we might be able to build tools to help uh, literary scholars uh, study the, the humor or the wordplay of a certain author. Um, writing assistance, if uh, we want to uh, help somebody write a funny speech, uh, maybe it can make some suggestions on how to insert uh, uh, jokes, possibly involving puns, uh, into the material. Similarly, computer, me computer media communication. Uh, there's already been a lot of uh, work, uh, some very famous work by uh, Graham Ritchie on uh, using computers to help people uh, communicate in, in real time uh, in a humorous manner. Um, virtual assistants, uh, likewise, uh, need to know, uh, for example, when you're joking, uh, when you're giving a, a command to uh, in, in jest to your virtual assistant, it needs to know not to actually uh, act on it. Uh, and uh, virtual assistants might also want to generate humor to, I don't know, diffuse a, a boring or intense situation. And uh, the application that I'm most interested in is, is machine translation. So uh, puns and wordplay and other forms of humor uh, pose tremendous difficulties for translators. Um, and uh, um, while they uh, translating humor and wordplay might be out of reach by uh, today's machine learning, or sorry, machine translation approaches, uh, we might actually be able to use uh, some uh, sort of uh, pun analysis software to at least help in human translation workflows to help uh, provide some guidance or some uh, uh, brainstorming or explanation uh, to translators who want to understand the pun in the source language or want to think of ideas for how it might be translated perhaps with some change in meaning in a target language. So on to the next part of the talk, very short one a presentation of the research questions. And basically we had two uh, in the present study. First of all, what is the relationship between the phonological distance between the pun and the target and the perceived funniness of the pun engine? And second, what is the relationship between the semantic distance between the pun and the target word and the perceived pun, uh, funniness of a pun engine? Those are the two questions. Here are the methods we used uh, to answer those two questions, or to attempt to answer those, those two questions. So first of all, we started with the data set. And our data was based on a collection of punning jokes uh, that I had originally compiled for uh, the Seminole 2017 workshop on the uh, detection and interpretation of puns, uh, which has since been uh, greatly expanded. Um, so the subset of this corpus that we used consists of 2,772 uh, English language punning jokes, of which 1,185 are heterographic, uh, and therefore probably also heterophonic, and 1,587 of which are homographic, and therefore uh, probably also homophonic. Um, so the original corpus had manually applied annotations that identify the pun and the target, in each joke in terms of the uh, forms of the words used and actually their meanings as well. And uh, the meanings were marked up with uh, respect to WordNet 3.1, which is a big lexical semantic database, uh, the sort of a, a semantic network graph that you saw on the previous slide, similar to that. Um, and in the present study, we further expanded this data set by adding phonemic annotations for the pun and target uh, word for each of the pun jokes. And we also incorporated humorous misjudgments uh, that I had actually gathered for a previous uh, Semival study in 2021, uh, which used that same Semival 2017 data set. And what we did was we got uh, over 1,000 click workers from Amazon Mechanical Turk to give us uh, pairwise judgments of the humorousness uh, of, of, of the jokes. So you can see here a screenshot of the sort of question that they were asked. They were presented with uh, basically two jokes. 
from the data set, and they were asked which one they thought was funnier, uh, either joke A, joke B, or both or neither. And why did we uh, do it that way? Why did we ask for pairwise judgments rather than just asking them, uh, presenting them with individual jokes and asking them to rate it on a scale of say one to five or one to 10? Uh, well, doing it a pairwise way uh, is actually uh, a lot less of a cognitive burden on the participants. Uh, and they're not, it's, it's not affected by biases towards high, lower, middle values or changes in individual rating behavior over time. And the advantage also of, of using pairwise judgments is that they can then be transformed using statistical processes into uh, a ranked list of jokes or into uh, numeric scores. Um, and we use two methods to do so. One of them is called BWS or best worst uh, scaling. And this is based on uh, a max diff random utility model uh, where we uh, focus on the least and most preferred item on the list. And so basically how this works is you uh, the, the score of a given instance or of a given of, of a given joke, I suppose, is the fraction of times it was chosen as best minus the fraction of times it was chosen as worst. Mm -hmm. And a uh, second um, method we use is called uh, Gaussian process preference learning or GPPL. And this uses the uh, thurston mosteller model as the random utility model. It's a Bayesian approach, uh, which has the benefit uh, that it's useful for noisy or small data sets, uh, or when you have small amounts of labeled data. And another uh, benefit of this is that you can actually, it's, it's actually a machine learning based approach. So it can generalize to, uh, to unseen uh, data as well, though we didn't actually use it for that purpose in this particular study. And uh, by and large, no matter which method you use, either BWS or GPPL, uh, you tend to get similar results as you can see in this graph. Uh, the, uh, the agreement uh, is fairly good between the two methods. And uh, we also uh, used a number of uh, phonological or phonetic distance measures uh, between the pun and the target. Um, and we used the uh, Abidos dot distance package, uh, Python package. Um, and we used, uh, we selected uh, four distance measures to use. So uh, the first of these was Levenstein. So Levenstein is a very, very basic, uh, a purely symbolic uh, comparison method. It only looks, works on a character based, uh, sorry, on, on, a, on a character level. Um, and it just counts basically the number of insertions, deletions, and changes uh, of the individual characters making up that uh, phonetic transcription. So it doesn't know anything about. Uh, phonology. Uh, it just considers each symbol to be distinct. Uh, Covington is a little bit of a step up from that. Uh, it um, divides the IPA symbols into consonants, vowels, and glides, uh, and it uh, works on the system of, of uh, on the basis of binary features. So there are eight features uh, for character types, and it does some sort of comparison that way. Uh, we have uh, a line, uh, which is probably the most intelligent. Uh, uh, phonetic distance measure we used. This is developed by a colleague of mine, Greg Kondrak, uh, who I think was then at the University of Toronto. Um, so it also works on the basis of IPA features, uh, not binary ones though as in Covington, but actually multi multi-valued ones. Uh, so there are basically feature salience weights uh, that code for the importance and relatively, relative importance of, of sound differences between words. And uh, whereas Covington uses eight different features, A-Line uses 20. And uh, finally, we use another relatively simplistic method called phonetic edit distance, uh, which is a variation of Levenstein distance, but adapted for strings in the international phonetic alphabet. Uh, so it also uses feature weights, but not multi value ones. So here's just a, a brief example showing you our implementation uh, of phonetic distance. Uh, so we have a couple of puns here. The first one is a homophonic one. Yesterday, I accidentally swallowed some food coloring. The doctor says I'm okay, but I feel like I died a little inside. So the pun uh, here is died, D-Y-E-D. Uh, the other, the target is died, D-I-E-D. Uh, the phonetic transcriptions of the, the two words are exactly the same. And so if we plug this into our Python package, we end up with a phonetic distance of, of zero. Um, the other one, on the other hand, is, is a, a heterophonic pun. Last night I dreamt that I had written Lord of the Rings. My wife said I'd been Tolkien in my sleep. So here the pun and target are Tolkien and talking, respectively. Uh, so again, here are the phonetic transcriptions of Tolkien or talking. And if we run this through our phonetic distance comparison, uh, I'm not sure exactly what method was used in this particular example, 
um, then we get a value here of 0 0.5. So the, the phonetic distances uh, range from 0 to 1. So semantic similarity, uh, again, uh, we used uh, various approaches, which were either network-based, uh, using uh, the WordNet semantic network as the underlying semantic graph, or information-based ones. Um, so the three network-based uh, semantic distance measures we used for semantic similarity measures were uh, path similarity, which is basically just the shortest path uh, in the graph between the two words. Uh, there's leapfrog chodoro similarity, uh, which is the same calculation, calculation as path similarity, but it also takes the maximal depth of the graph uh, into account. There is uh, Wu-Palmer similarity, which is the depth in the taxonomy of the two senses, plus the depth of their least common subsumer, uh, that is the most specific ancestor node. Um, we used a couple of information content methods, pure information content methods. Uh, there is a Resnick similarity and a Jane Conrath similarity. Um, actually, Jan Conrath is actually, I think, a combination of information network based. Uh, Lin similarity, I believe, is uh, information based only. And finally, we also tried a word to vec similarity, which is an information content based method that, unlike the other ones, um, is based on, on, on word embeddings, uh, which is basically, uh, well, you can use machine learning for that, uh, looking for, for word co occurrences uh, across a large corpus and then sort of uh, massaging the uh, co-occurrence matrix. Uh, the exact um, uh, workings of the algorithms here aren't, aren't really important. Uh, these are all basically well-established methods, and we just wanted to try uh, a large number of them to see which, if any of them, uh, would work. So again, just an example uh, from uh, uh, of our implementation. So uh, from the uh, die and die uh, pun that you saw in the earlier slide, uh, we can compare uh, dye meaning color with dye and dye meaning feel indifferent towards and end up with a semantic similarity score, say, of 0 0.2857, or uh, compare Tolkien and talking and end up with a much lower semantic similarity score. So um, here on this slide uh, are the three main hypotheses that we wanted to test. So first of all, uh, pun type, comparison of funniness ratings for homographic and heterographic puns. Uh, we hypothesize that um, because uh, homographic, uh, therefore uh, homophonic puns uh, are closer in pronunciation, we would expect to see uh, a higher funniness rating for them, or high, higher humorousness. Uh, second, phonology. Um, so this one is, is a, uh, a more specific case of the previous one, uh, given that we have a, a, a heterophonic pun, we would expect to see a correlation between uh, phonological distance or phonological similarity and the funniness of a pun uh, in terms of uh, uh, a continuous value score. And finally, uh, semantics. Um, we also uh, hypothesized that uh, if the two words being punned upon uh, were sort of in the middle range of semantic similarity, we would expect to see a higher funniness rating. Uh, that's because if the two uh, uh, words being punned upon, the pun and the target, are too different uh, semantically uh, or they're too similar, uh, this doesn't form a good basis for a pun in general. So uh, we basically ran the phonological and uh, semantic similarity measures on all the puns and targets on our data set and uh, compared them with the existing humorousness scores uh, that we got with BWS or GPPL in the data set and did some uh, correlation analyses. And I'm gonna present uh, the results now. So first of all, uh, humorousness ratings. So this graph shows the funniness ratings for our data set represented by the BWS ranks and the GPPL scores uh, and I normalized them onto a scale of zero to one, and I quantified, or sorry, quantized them to 10 buttons. So we can see here um, that the frequency distribution for both ratings methods is similar. And this is basically just to reassure us that it, it shouldn't really matter whether we use BWS or GPPL, we would expect to get uh, similar results uh, with each one. So uh, a more interesting result now, uh, we actually, uh, tested the funniness ratings um, of 
the uh, um, heterographic puns and compare these for the uh, uh, funniest ratings of the holographic puns. And an independent samples t-test shows that there is a significant difference in the scores for homographic and heterographic puns. And the box plots here give a direct comparison between the funniness ratings of the two pun types, uh, indicating that funniness ratings were higher for the holographic than for the heterographic edition. And what's striking here is the large vari uh, variance in funniness ratings in both directions, uh, which you can see indicated here by the long whiskers. Um, further, there seems to be a number of outliers in the lower range of the funniness ratings, uh, especially for the holographic group. But the big take home message here is that indeed, uh, holographic and therefore probably homophonic puns uh, are on average funnier than heterographic or heterophonic puns. So we can say that our first hypothesis uh, is proven. Now with respect to um, phonology, this plot shows a quantized frequency distribution for the phonological distance ratings for our data set using various phonological distance measures. And unsurprisingly, most of the uh, punning jokes and presumably virtually all of the holographic ones lie at the far left of the graph. And there are virtually none on the right. And this is because the target must be similar to the pun or else the reader or listening, listener has no hope of recognizing it as a pun, uh, basically of recovering the target. Our more important finding, however, is a significant correlation of funniness ratings with phonetic similarity, as we can see on this slide. Uh, these scatter plots show the relationship between funniness ratings on the vertical axis and phonetic distance on the horizontal axis. And so uh, our correlation analyses resulted in a significant negative correlation for Levenstein distance in GPPL, uh, or BWS for that matter, and also a significant negative correlation for A-line distance in GPPL, or A-line distance and BWS. So we can say that our hypothesis that a lower phonological distance results in higher funniness rating, uh, we can say that that hypothesis also seems to be proven. And finally, uh, semantic similarity. So this frequency plot is similar to the one that we saw for phonetic similarity, except that it's for semantic similarity. And we can see that there's a bit more variation across the different semantic similarity measures but generally, most puns tend to have high semantic distance from the targets. Um, beyond this rather um, unsurprising result, we actually uh, weren't able to come to any conclusions. Uh, in, in particular, we did not observe any significant correlation between semantic distance and uh, the funniness of a joke. So unfortunately, our uh, third hypothesis that a semantic similarity in the middle range would result in higher funniness ratings uh, remains uh, unproven. So, some brief discussion of the results. Well, we did see a, a large variance in funniness ratings uh, across both pun types. And why might this be? Well, probably because uh, punning is actually a rather complex phenomenon. Um, we saw that a lower phonological distance resulted in higher funniness ratings, which is in line with the uh, suppositions uh, that had been advanced uh, in, in previous literature, for example, Lagerquist in 1980. Um, but it's uh, rather interesting that the negative correlation was only significant for Levenstein in airline distance. Uh, and uh, why is this? Uh, it's, it's not exactly clear because uh, even without taking into account the specific phonological features, the mere orthographic distance, uh, which is all that uh, Levenstein does, seems to be enough to be associated with funniness ratings to uh when written. So um, A-line, even though it's uh, multi-weighted, uh, we didn't quite see the same results. Um, with respect to uh, semantics, uh, we didn't really get any significant results at all. And that might be because there actually is no correlation of between correlation of semantics and funniness. That is semantics, uh, the semantic distance between the pun and the target and the funniness of the overall joke. Uh, in general, uh, for most of the uh, um, uh, jokes that we analyzed, the distance, the semantic distance between the pun and the target was, was very close to zero, which was actually not in line with our expectation that it would be somewhere in the middle, somewhere between zero and one. Uh, it could be that the, um, 
uh, uh, the, the funniness, or at least the, the semantic contribution of funniness and the funny, funny joke has more to do with the, the, the context uh, of, of the joke than the actual individual word being punned upon. So uh, in conclusion, we can say that uh, it is indeed true that uh, speakers aim to preserve homophony in order to facilitate target recovery. Uh, and therefore, uh, homographic or homophonic puns tend to be funnier. Um, however, there are probably many other influencing factors on funniness ratings uh, beyond merely phonology. Uh, punning is a multi-layered phenomenon that involves the intersection of phonology, semantics, pragmatics, and a cultural background uh, of the uh, of the punter, of punster and, and the audience. Uh, we should also stress that this, what we're presenting here is only a correlation analysis. Uh, only limited assumptions can be made regarding the direct causal influence of phonological distance on the perception of funniness and punning jokes. And of course, our our data set also presented a number of uh, limitations. So we were working only with canned jokes, that is one-liners that were presented in isolation, such as you might get uh, in, a, in a joke book. Um, we didn't get them in context, you know, for, for example, uh, puns that you might find in a novel or a screenplay uh, or a standard comedy routine. And we had uh, almost no demographic information whatsoever on the uh, annotators who did these pairwise judgments uh, of, of funniness uh, for our corpus. Basically, all we know about them is that they um, were located in the United States and self-identified as native speakers of English. Uh, but humor is known to be um, uh, very dependent on, on cultural background, uh, possibly also on, on gender and other factors of the experiencer. Uh, and so it would be nice to have more demographic information on the humorous misreadings so that we could take these into uh, into, effect, uh, into account. So that brings me to the end of the uh, talk. And uh, I suppose we might have time for questions. Thank you all for uh, your uh, attention. <laughs>